Good evening. If we could come to order, this is uh, the November 19th, 2018, 7 o'clock p.m. meeting of the Alamance County Board of Commissioners. And all the commissioners are present. And um, when we last met, we had the call to order at the commissioner's meeting room down the street. So if we could please have a motion to reconvene in the historic courthouse. Second. Thank you. Uh, we have a motion and a second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right. Thank you. Um, it's my uh, privilege tonight to offer the invocation for this meeting. If anyone cares to join me in prayer, he or she is certainly welcome. However, if you're not a person of prayer, please do not feel obligated to join in. But if you care to, please bow your head with me. Heavenly Father, we just lift up our hearts to you this evening, seeking wisdom and guidance for this county. I pray that your hand of blessing would be on each of us as we go forward through our, our duties as commissioners. Lord, I pray that you would also bless those who sacrifice in the service to our country and our community, whether it's overseas and through the armed services, or whether it's through um, the municipal and, and the law enforcement agencies and, and firefighters and other people who uh, work hard to keep our community safe, Lord. We also pray for those whose lives have been touched by death in the last few weeks, Lord. Um, some precious lives in our community have been lost, and we lift those up to you tonight. Um, we just pray that the words of our hearts and, or the words of our lips and the meditations of our hearts would be pleasing in your sight. It's in your name we pray. Amen. 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 If you would please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag. Tonight we have some special guests with us, uh, the 20, 2018 Fall County Government Academy, or County Government 101, has its graduates, and we want to recognize them, and we have certificates to give them tonight, so I'm going to call your name, and if you would come forward, please, and get your certificate.
then we have four perfect attendance awards as well. People who were able to make it to every single week of the Academy, which is so awesome. The first is for David Lee. Okay, next on our agenda is our public speakers. And before we jump into the public speakers, I want to uh, take a moment to review our public comment policy and our rules of procedure for the commissioner meetings. Um, the public comment policy for the Alamance County Board of Commissioners was adopted as revised in September of 2014. So it's been around for a while. The public comment period and this uh, public comment policy is available to be reviewed on the county website. If uh, anybody wants to do that, we encourage you to review it before you come to a meeting if you're thinking about uh, engaging in the public comment period. The comment period is limited to a maximum of 30 minutes. Um, then we'll have a commissioner's response period immediately following the public comment period, which is a point of response from the commissioners to respond to comments that have been made and not debate with the public. Each person designed to speak to, during the public comment period shall have three minutes to make his or her remarks. There's, and I look at that as being like the shot clock in college basketball. It's, uh, you know, when the shot clock goes off, the ref gives the ball to the other team, no matter who, what's going on. So if uh, the three minutes is up and I ask the speaker to return to his or to her seat, it's not a reflection on the content of the speech. It's just the three minutes is over. There shall be no more than three speakers on any one topic per meeting. So if there are people here tonight who are desiring to speak in favor of a topic, we would have three speakers in favor of an issue. And if there are people who wish to be heard against an issue, then we would have three speakers in that regard. But um, that's the limit for that by the policy. Um, speakers shall address the board from the lectern at the front of the room and begin their remarks by stating their name and address. If you have a disabling condition, if you would uh, still like to address the board, we would be delighted to hear from you. If you uh, need accommodation, if you let us know, we'd be more than happy to try to make that happen. Uh, public comment is not intended to require the Board of Commissioners to answer any impromptu questions. Speakers shall address all comments to the commissioners as a whole and not to individual commissioners. Discussions between speakers and members of the audience shall not be allowed. Speakers shall be, please be courteous in their language and presentation. Um, then speakers please don't discuss matters which concern the candidacy of a person speak, seeking public office, members that are the subject of public hearings, <coughs> matters which are closed session matters, um, anticipated or pending litigation, personnel, property acquisitions, and matters which are made confidential by law. Um, speakers should not engage in personal attacks by that by irrelevance, duration, or tone may threaten or perceive to threaten the orderly and fair progress of the discussion. Then we also have the rules of procedure for the Alamance County Board of Commissioners, which I believe was adopted well, adopted as amended the 17th day of April 2017. 
And in that, we have a Article 6, Section 7, Decorum of the Audience. Audience members, please refrain from making unsolicited comments during the meeting. During speakers from the floor or debate by the board, audience members refrain from conduct that disrupts the proceeding. Um, and it, please, sell, um, audience members shall silence all cell phones and other electronic devices while attending the meeting. So please, if you have a cell phone and you haven't already silenced it, if you would take the opportunity now to please do that. So we have a few people signed up as uh, public speakers. And the first is Mr. Sam Page. Good evening, Madam Chair, to the commissioners. Uh, at this time, I'd like to relinquish uh, my speech to uh, Eric Franklin. Okay. I'd like to defer my time. Okay. Thank you. Can I get a full three minutes? Yes, please, okay. um, please tell us your name and where you All live. Right. My name is Eric Franklin. I am a resident in Gibsonville and in Alamance County, of course. Tonight I'm representing the North Carolina Police Benevolent Association. I am also the president of the local Central Piedmont chapter. The North Carolina PBA represents 12,000 police officers, sheriffs, deputies, detention officers, and others. Most of these deputies and detention officers started the profession when they were much younger than I am now. Many of them did not have families that depended on them and mortgages to pay at that time. When I first started, I would have worked for room and board because I loved my job so much. There are some tough decisions before you in your positions tonight. Before you make these decisions, though, I'd ask that you put yourself into four roles before you make any decisions. First, I'd like you to take a moment and consider the role of the victim. Something bad has happened and his fam and his hap something bad has happened or is happening and you are calling 911. The person on the other end of the phone becomes your lifeline. The telecommunicator gives the call to the sheriff's unit in your area. Because of the technology available, the dispatcher can actually see the units closest to your incident and can make sure the right ones respond. The deputies respond with the appropriate response in order to help you. They may or may not respond in time. We cannot prevent every bad thing, nor can we save everyone. But could someone else have been closer with more personnel available? Second, take a moment and consider the role of the victim's loved one or next of kin. Are they going to be praising a quick response or upset because of a delayed response time due to insufficient number of deputies on the road? Third, I'd like you to take the moment to uh, consider the role of the sheriff's deputy or detention officer. Whether we are speaking of detention staff or deputies, each one of these people, these men and women, prepare for, the, for, prepare for battle before what may be their last shift. With the people that the detention staff and deputies have to fight at times, they need backup that can get to them quickly. I'm not sure how many of you have had to fight, for somebody, fight somebody for two minutes, but two minutes nonstop is a long time. On a regular night, a deputy may be 20 to 30 minutes away from his or her nearest backup. Our detention officers and, det and deputies need as, much, need as many people as necessary in case someone is tied up on a crime scene, out sick, on vacation, or in training. My first day at the sheriff's office, I was on the road patrolling an entire county by myself for three hours because every other deputy was tied up. A lot has changed since then, but the sheriff's office has gotten much busier also. Last, I ask you to consider the role of the spouse or loved one of the Alamance County Sheriff's Deputy or Detention Officer. Imagine, if you will, sleeping alone while your partner is working night shift. At 1.30 in the morning, your phone starts ringing, waking you up. You don't want to look at it or answer it because you know what it might be. Someone asking you to go to the hospital because your loved one is hurt or has been in an accident. Mr. Franklin, that was the timer that rang. Yeah. Um, I didn't. I actually didn't get a full three minutes. Uh, may, may I just have my last paragraph? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I didn't see that. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay. All the possibilities go through your mind as you finally look at the phone and see it's your best friend or a relative just wanting to gripe at you. And then, of course, you're upset at your friend because they called you in the middle of the night, but you also have a relief knowing that your loved one is safe, at least for that moment. These are victims, spouses, partners, friends, colleagues, and voters. 
They want to know that they and their loved ones are safe. You can help them feel safer by providing these deputies and detention officers with personnel, pay, benefits, vehicles, and equipment that they need in order to protect the citizens of Alamance County. Thank you for your time. Thank you. All right, next is uh, Mr. Jose Perez. Mr. Perez is going to be delivering his remarks in Spanish, and we ask that accommodation be made for the interpretation. Of course. Buenas noches, señores comisionados. Mi Good evening. Mi nombre es Jose Perez. Llevo 22 años en Burlington. Yo soy propietario de un negocio de llantas. Empecé desde el 2007. Good evening, County Commissioners. My name is Jose Perez, and I have been living in Burlington for 22 years. I have a small business, a uh, tire business, since 2007. Estoy aquí porque estoy en contra de cualquier presencia de migración de ICE en Alamance. I am here because I am against any presence of Immigration Customs Enforcement in Alamance County. La verdad es que cualquier, cualquier colaboración con ICE, ya sea la 287 o el acuerdo de ICE, para operar en la cárcel de Alamance, trae consecuencias de desconfianza, de desconfianza de la comunidad inmigrante hacia las autoridades y hará que las personas tengamos miedo a hacerse uh, acercarse a las autoridades. The truth is that any collaboration with ICE, be it 287G or any other ag agreement to operate inside of the Alamance County Detention Center will have as a consequence the total distrust of the immigrant community towards the uh, authorities and it will make people have fear to come forward. Lo digo porque yo mismo, yo mismo he experimentado esa experiencia. La policía local y el sheriff de Graham trabajan con ICE y desanima a la gente a, a denunciar un delito. I say this because I myself has, have experienced that when the local police and sheriff worked with Immigration Customs Enforcement, this discouraged people from coming forward to report crime. Yo, en el año 2007, Yo fui víctima de cinco, cinco este, veces que me robaron. A mi taller se llevaron dinero, se llevaron rines, computadora, todo lo electrónico. Y no quise, me dijo el policía que yo tenía el derecho de ir a denunciar a la, a, a la corte. No pude ir porque estaba la 287, estaba ICE en la corte. Y me iba a ir más mal a mí que al ladrón. In 2007, I was a victim of five robberies to my business. On five separate occasions, there was someone who went into my business and stole computers, uh, rims, tires. And the last time that this happened, uh, the person was caught inside of my, my uh, business. And the police said that I had the right to come forward and report this crime. But I didn't do so because at the time, 287G was in the county and I feared to be in greater jeopardy than the person that committed the crime. Así como yo, hay miles, miles de hispanos que no denunciamos un delito por temor a que ICE está en Alamance. Alamance no tiene que haber ICE. Just like me, there are many other people, immigrant people and Latinx people, who will not come forward because if ICE is in Alamance, we will not trust anyone. Todos queremos un lugar seguro en Alamance. Todos queremos estar bien. Todos que tenemos, queremos sentirnos seguros para reportar un delito. Por eso no debe de haber ICE en Alamance. Queremos un, algo seguro en Alamance. We all want to have a safe community in Alamance. And we should all feel safe to come forward in reporting crimes in Alamance. And that is why I say that ICE should not be anywhere in Alamance. Gracias por escucharme. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. And thank you for um, being available to interpret. And yeah, I think it's, since um, there's two people talking, you get extra time. That's easy. <laughs> Accommodation to make. Okay, Mr. Bruce Nelson.
Thank you. I'm Bruce Nelson. I live in Graham. Been a resident of North Carolina for eight or nine years, Alamance County for a couple. I'm against 287G. I'm against an ISGA agreement. I'm against a jail agreement. I'll give you the reasons why. Last week, our sheriff announced he was no longer a favor implementing 287G in Alamance County. Now it seems to be on the ver he's on the verge of announcing a new program with ICE that will rent bed space in the Alamance County Jail that will in fact turn the Alamance County Jail into a de facto ICE detention center for profit. If that is his plan and he implements it, there will be significant financial incentives to find even more people and push them into the detention and deportation process. Agreements with ICE or jail agreements have nothing to do with giving the local sheriff unique and necessary tools to fight gangs, cartels, or other hideous crimes. Our law system has all those tools. Otherwise, why do less than 2.5% of the counties in this United States, there are 3,000 of them, only 2.5 have agreements with ICE, and three of the six North Carolina counties that had ICE agreements are ending them. The question is why? Agreements and ICE for one reason and for one reason only, to vigorously enforce our nation's broken immigration laws, something our federal government refuses to do. And if our county enters to an ICE jail agreement, we have ideology for profit in Alamance County. In North Carolina's counties have no oversight, accountability, responsibilities with regard to sheriff's policies. To date, our county has been unwilling or unable to provide reasonable access to public records in regards to immigration enforcement. In fact, one of our commissioners suggested in a meeting that the county should substantially raise the cost of getting access to those records. Why and why the lack of transparency? But even the bigger question, why isn't the public entitled to an open public forum where two-way dialogue and discussion can take place on such a controversial subject as this. This format is not two-way, it's one. We get to make comments, you get to make comments in turn, there's no dialogue. 47% of our county's voters in the last election voted for candidates who oppose agreements with ICE. This is a controversial issue and it should be addressed in a full public hearing. But the bigger question is, why shouldn't this be an agenda item in our county commissioner's meeting? Why shouldn't we hear, or why should we hear or read about news when they, with the intentions our sheriff has? Why shouldn't we expect full access to public records to ensure accountability? If cartels, gangs, and other hideous crimes are rising, why shouldn't we have factual demographic data that supports the inference that immigrants are the primary cause for those increases. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. All right, Jay Kennett. Good evening. I'm the Reverend Jay Kennett, and I'm a 24-year resident of Burlington, North Carolina. As a pastor, I am guided by the scriptures that call me to welcome the immigrant. As a Christian, I'm guided by the command of Jesus to love my neighbor as myself. In order to do this, I have sought to get to know my immigrant neighbors. And these are the neighbors that I have met. A mom who having one child died in her arms crosses all barriers to assure her other children are safe. A dad who tried his hardest to get a job sees his children starving in front of him and goes to where he can work and feed his family. A mother with a child born with a disability knows that when she cannot care for him, he will have to beg in the streets. So she gathers him up and gets him to a place where he can live. A young boy in a conversation about what he wanted to do when he grows up mentions that sometimes he's afraid to go home for he fears his mom and dad will be taken away. I believe I am called to welcome these neighbors and I believe a decision to have ice in our jail and a detention center there will harm them. 
Our commissioners and others will say, you have to do it the right way. But we know, all know that our immigration policies in this country are broken and do not provide a right way. We may say they are just bad criminals, but the reality and the data show that they are also these same moms and dads. To me, the real question before us is not about 287G or whatever name we choose to call this program. The question is about what type of community we want to live in. Do we want, to be, want it to be one where we see our neighbors as moms and dads, just like us, wanting the best for their children? Or do we see some people as illegal people? Do we want a community that works together to stop crime and uncover gains? Or do we want to drive some of our neighbors into hiding, afraid to speak out about the crimes they see? Do we want to be a community where all children are taken care of? Or where one child comes home and looking around, realizing his greatest fear has happened as he whispers, where is my mom? You see, the decision for the county commissioners and for all of us is not about programs. It's about the community that we want. And do we want a community built on fear and division or one on, built on the hopes and possibilities of us all? My hope and my prayer as commissioners and the sheriff and all the community, we choose the one built on the care and love of our neighbors because that is the community I want to build. And I hope everyone will join me in that task. Thank you. Okay, next speaker on the list is Mr. Robert Villani. Um, is he here, Mr. Villani? Can I ask you, Mr. Villani, are you intending to speak um, in opposition to ICE and the 287G program? Is that the thrust of your no, remarks? No, I'm here to speak about the bond. Okay. The well, please come on down. <laughs> we, would, we would love to hear what you have to say about that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, commissioners, for allowing me to speak this evening. I'm Robert Villani, I live at 529 Hillcrest. I'm a licensed classroom teacher and Burlington homeowner. Poor Brian Haygood, you have my sympathy. Maybe you tried to warn the commissioners and the county residents that the math would not add up, that you cannot vote for a million dollar bond and not somehow raise taxes. Or maybe you underestimate the country gentleman salesmanship of Mr. Donnelly. But we're in a pickle, bud. The county voters rejected the mechanism to pay for our bond. Poor, poor Mr. Haygood. And now everybody's watching. If the voters were Santa, your stocking is full of coal. I hope you have an idea because uh, I've not heard a good one yet. Oh, yeah. Well, I guess I have heard one idea that's floating around, and if this is what passes for an idea nowadays, let's rent out the county jails to ICE and use that to pay for the money to build our school and a brand new high school to boot. How do you explain this? Well, see, the thing is, we have no money for schools, no money for social services, no money for restorative justice programs in our courts, but we got this sweet deal going with the Department of Justice. Yet. Funding any county service on the ICE money is like Judas Iscariot running back to the upper room where the apostles sat saying, hey, I got us 30 pieces of silver. This is blood money pure and simple. Arrechazo te dinero de sangre no puede hacerlo. The sheer number of people here tonight are demanding that the school bond is funded properly and appropriately. It's its own testimony that the thousands of, the hundreds of people have come out tonight, have gathered in this space to see what we can do. Is this the best we can do? I don't think the future of Alamance County can wait on such a thing. See, the elected officials tonight, all eyes are on you. Mr. Haygood, you're in the hot seat. All people of faith, all people of hope, all people of compassion, we demand the highest that this county can offer us. Thank you. All right. Next, we have Erica Johnson. Mm. 
Is she upstairs? Erica Johnson? Is Erica Johnson here? Okay, I don't see her. So next we have Lash Reitenberry. <laughs> My name's Lash Reitenberry, and I've been in this county over 74 years. And I want to present a proposal to you guys tonight, and I want Mr. Haygood to put it on the agenda for the next meeting. This means a great deal to me. We've got the best sheriff in Alamance County in my lifetime. He's done more to protect this county and the citizens than any sheriff we've ever had. I want to ask you to name the new training center the Terry S. Johnson Training Center. That's the only thing it can be done. But I also want you to look at all these men and women here. Anybody in uniform, will you guys stand up for me, please? These men and... <laughs> these men and women have a thankless job. They not only cover the roads of Alamance County, ride with one of them, ride to the edge of Caswell County with one, and he runs up on an accident or shooting. He's got help 20 miles away. That's wrong. Detention officers walk through the jail. They're spit on. Human waste is thrown at them. They're cussed and we don't pay them. Would you do their job for what they get paid? There's not a man and woman in this room in that uniform that should be making less than $40,000 a year. They've got families. Instead of giving our raises to administrators and to supervisors, let's take care of our men and women in the detention center and our men and women that patrol the streets of Alamance County. That's a dangerous job. We've lost two good officers in North Carolina in the last three weeks. Folks, we don't pay them enough. Look what they go through. They protect us every day and every night. Three o'clock in the morning when you're sleeping, they're patrolling Alamance County. And if they need that man right there, he gets out of bed and goes. I know him. So I'm asking you to support a raise for these men and women in the name of the, uh, the new training center, the Terry S. Johnson Training Center. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, um, the people who are here um, in opposition to ICE and 287G, they also feel strongly about their issue, and they were not applauding, so I ask you to show the same consideration for the rules of the body that they should. Um, however, I might feel about one or another. It's my job to enforce the rules. So, Mr. Moon, John Moon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioners. Uh, I had the opportunity to attend the uh, Alamance County Government Academy, and the first night we met with Mr. Brian Haygood, and he kind of laid it out there what it was going to be like, and Tory Frank, his assistant, uh, was always there, very helpful and stuff. And uh, I have something that I would like to give to those two individuals. If Mr. Haygood would come forward, please. This is a Armor of God coin. He served in the United States Marine Corps, 
like for you to have that. Thank you for everything that you did for us. Appreciate it very much. Mr. Sprint, Mr. Corey, if you'll come up. Okay. This is, uh, the verdict is in. This is a gift card from the verdict. You did an outstanding <laughs> job, and we appreciated everything that you did for us, and uh, I've learned a lot, and uh, thank you for everything. Uh, that's really nice that you clapped for me, but these folks over here on my left, the department heads who had their folks come out and explain what was going on with us was outstanding. And uh, you're great people, and thank you what you do for Alamance County. Uh, I, got, I was sick Friday night and ran into Susan Osborne at Harbor Inn, and she called today to see how I was doing. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to back up what Mr. Reitenberry said, if that's possible. Uh, I've been a sheriff's deputy now for 12 years. Terry Johnson's been in office 16 years. And from the time he hit the floor, elected, running, training, training, training. Professionalism, professionalism, and accountability has been the backbone of his organization from the time he's been there. I've been down three times, sepsis, bypass surgery, and I lost a big toe. Don't laugh. Uh, in all three of those instances, he was there for me to make sure I was okay, just as he would with any of his officers or any citizen that needed help in any way, shape, fashion, or form. Uh, I think if you go back and you check it out, you will see that he's talked about the training center for a long time, okay? Uh, down at Swepsville, the land down there, the folks down there didn't kind of want it down there, so we're now looking up north, okay? We have a wonderful opportunity to have a public safety training center. The only thing that I would disagree with Mr. Reitenberry about, it should be called public safety training center because it's going to go EMS, fire, share law enforcement training, okay? I uh, appreciate the opportunity to come and speak with you. Sheriff, I apologize. I did not stand up. Uh, I was not in uniform, and I didn't want to get reprimanded, okay? <laughs> so... Uh, I uh, appreciate everything if y'all do for the county. I think you got some tough roads ahead of you, but you're some strong people and you'll make the best decisions for Alamance County. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moon. Next person on the list is Margaret Dameron. My name is Margaret Dameron, and I understand, and if I'm wrong, please correct me, that the Rock Quarry wants to go down on Bass Mountain Road. Have you? I'm telling you, if there's no way you didn't let them put it down before, and that's been years. Well, since then, on Sunrise Trail, I don't know how many trailers are there. And then on my land, there's at least three springs where my daughter plans to get her water from. And I think that you should vote against it and not let them do it. <laughs> so what do you say? You agree with me? <laughs> Cameron, let's, uh, let's not the, um, it's an opportunity for you to address the board, and then after all the public comments have been made, then the commissioners can have the chance to respond. So that's kind of the setup. Well, if, if you just go out and take a look, you know, before you make your decision then, there's, oh, I don't know how many houses been built down there. And I can tell you, it'd be a disaster to put that thing down there. Thank you, ma'am. Um, Gary Williamson. Commissioners, it's always a pleasure. Uh, Sheriff and all of our elected officials. Uh, I'm Gary Williamson, Snow Camp, North Carolina. Been here 39 years. Uh, plan on being here another 39, hopefully, so we'll see. Um, but I just want to start out, and I just want to give 
give praise. Uh, give praise to all of our elected officials, uh, our elected leaders, our law enforcement. Uh, Alamance County is very strong in what they feel about their elected leaders and their law enforcement. Uh, Sheriff's Office, Grand Police Department, Burlington, all the way down the line. Uh, we just had an election and we unelected some and elected more. Uh, the majority of the people did that and we lay respect to you guys uh, to give back to us on what we voted for. We elect you to handle our affairs, uh, governmental affairs. Uh, what you guys decide to do, we support. We elected y'all and we put y'all here. If our sheriff decides that he needs to put a detention center over here to give more jobs to our county, uh, to bring more money into our county, then so be it. We stand by him. We elected him and we elected y'all. Uh, there's also a thing called uh, laws, uh, and we stand by those laws. Uh, if you commit a crime, you own up to that responsibility. You did it. Legal is legal. Illegal is illegal. A rose is a rose. Uh, you have to, no, there should not be one that gets uh, something that another does not. Uh, if I get a speeding ticket, I have to own up to that. I got to go down here. I got to pay for it. If I did something illegally, my tags wasn't right or whatever the case may be, I got to own up to that. I got to pay for it. Uh, that being said, all the way across the board, there are neighboring counties that are letting lawlessness, and uh, I could say a few other words that, you know, we just don't feel like in Alamance County fit our uh, ways of life. Uh, we want to stand up and stand by the way that we were raised and the way that we have learned to live in this county our whole lives. Um, we hope our county commissioners, our sheriffs, and our police department understand that, you know, we are the majority. And we feel like that, uh, you know, what you guys put into place is what we're going to stand by and we're going to keep supporting you. Uh, just like this last election, if uh, we feel like that's not correct, then, uh, you know, there'll be some open seats. And then, and congratulations, Mr. Steve Carter, by the way, uh, county commissioner there. Uh, we hope he does a great job for us. Um, I just wanted to speak my mind and give praise to our law enforcement, especially our sheriff's department. They are amazing. Uh, you guys are amazing, and we hope to keep up a good job, and we hope to keep seeing y'all shiny faces up here for a long time. Uh, do not let political correctness take over Alamance County. You will be called anything and everything, and I'm a true testament of that, that they will t call you every name in the book if they don't agree with you. Stand up for what's right, do what's right, and keep doing it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Williamson. He is the last person to have signed up for public comments. And so now do we have any commissioner responses? Just jump in there. Whoever wants to go first. Uh, Ms. Dameron, I guess we can address your issue. It's not going to be on Bass Mountain Road. So there is, <laughs> just to correct your location of that quarry, but we're, we're still working with that. We can't talk about it because they've got a lawyer now. That's true. Well, I'll just say I appreciate everybody who spoke for speaking and speaking from your heart. Anyone else? Yeah, Ms. Dameron, I especially wanted to come back to you um, that um, Mr. Boswell's right that the, there is a group that has gotten a lawyer and has said some, we've sent a letter to the county now, and so we're limited in what we can say about it publicly, but the state's coming. The, when is the meeting where the, we have that? December 5th. December 5th, the Department of Environmental Quality is coming to Sylvan Elementary School, and they're gonna have a public hearing where I'm really actually extremely happy that you brought this up because this is a great opportunity to talk about that, that they're going to have a public hearing at Sylvan Elementary School where people can come and voice their concerns about water quality, um, air quality, what other kind of issues that you have. And so, um, and I think that information is already on our county website or it will be. Uh, the station will have a couple public notes. at 7 p.m. So um, thank you for coming out tonight and raising that issue. Okay, so if there's no other responses, then next is to uh, approve the agenda. If everyone has had the opportunity, all the commissioners have had the opportunity to review the agenda, we could have a motion for approval. So moved. Second. 
I have a motion and a second for approval of the agenda. Is there any further discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Consent agenda is next. Um, if everyone has had the chance to review the items on the consent agenda. I will make a motion that we approve as done. I second that. Thank you, gentlemen. We have a motion and a second for approval of the consent agenda. Is there any further discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Thank you very much. Now we have a bond referendum update by our county manager, Mr. Haygood. for the press. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So good evening, Madam Chair and Commissioners. It's a pleasure to be here this evening. I'm going to go over a little bit of information about uh, uh, the ABSS and ACC bonds. Uh, it's been a lot of activity lately, and I thought it would be appropriate uh, now that the um, election is over to give you an update on where we are. This uh, doesn't require any action tonight, so this is really just to kind of bring you up to speed to where, uh, uh, where county government and our staff are at this point. So, um, As we all know, we had the election on November 6th, and the uh, school system and community college bond issues were approved by the voters. This has given the Board of Commissioners the authority to issue debt uh, general obligation bonds. So before uh, you can't issue that debt without the public support, the public vote, you now have that authority. Uh, however, as we all know, the Article 46 sales tax was not approved uh, by the voters. Um, and I've had a number of questions from the public and from other folks uh, about this, uh, but the commissioners must have voter approval uh, to institute a, uh, Article 46 sales tax. So uh, I think the chair mentioned this earlier. Uh, the next time that uh, this will be uh, able to be put on the ballot will be the primary in 2020. It does require uh, a countywide vote. So at this point, the commissioners can't put that uh, sales tax into place without the vote of the public. So just to give you a, a little bit of a reminder about uh, what all the planning work that we've done uh, to prepare for the uh, bond vote. Uh, we prepared a capital finance plan uh, that put together uh, a list of projects by the uh, school system and the community college and county government, in fact, but for the uh, uh, tax rate implications was community college and school system. And the capital financing plan, uh, we work very closely with school system staff and community college staff to uh, understand the timing of projects, the anticipated costs of the projects from both entities. Uh, we estimated a 4.5% interest rate in our planning model. Uh, and we also uh, put together our planning model uh, where the debt would be structured uh, using level principle uh, to, to come up with the repayment schedule. So those are kind of the, the givens that we used uh, as putting together our capital plan. So if you'll remember, the total proposed bond debt was $189.6 million. Of that, uh, the school system's bond debt was $150 million and the community college at $39.6 million. All those projects, the, the project timings, the interest rate that we assumed, and uh, using level principle is where we came up with a maximum estimated property tax rate that we put out before the public, before the vote, of 7.88 cents. That was also hinged on the uh, commissioners being willing to institute that property tax up front before the projects began. So at this point, where are we at with the bonds? Uh, I want to let the commissioners know what you can be expecting, what you can be looking for. So at this time, uh, county staff has been working with uh, Davenport and the local government commission to schedule a meeting for the week of November the 26th. Uh, what we'd like to do is go down. If you'll remember, one of the options that we looked at to try to lessen the property tax impact is structuring the debt. The 7.88 cents is based on level principle. We have another option uh, given to us by the state of North Carolina where we can structure the debt, but uh, we need to go down to the local government commission, meet with them, and talk about that. If you'll remember, back I think in March, I told you they have concerns about using that model, but it is legal. So the week of November 26, we're going to schedule an appointment uh, with the local government commission to talk about that model and to tell them that's what uh, the board is interested in doing. Then uh, November 26th and 27th, we've arranged meetings with Alamance Burlington School System staff and the community college staff to go back over again 
bond projects, timelines, proposed costs, and, uh, and to make any updates that we need to to our capital plan. So we're going to get back together with the school system staff and the community college staff with county uh, finance and myself and go back over the projects and make sure we're all on the same page. Then at your December 3rd Board of Commissioner meeting, uh, you can expect to see a declaration of election results. So the uh, Board of Elections has uh, finished their canvassing. That was completed on Friday. And let me just take this opportunity to thank Kathy Holland and all of her folks for a fantastic uh, experience in this election. They work very hard, and I certainly appreciate it, and I know you do, and uh, all the citizens should too. So Kathy and her folks have, uh, have uh, finished their canvassing. So on December 3rd, I'm going to bring a declaration to you and ask you to approve. It's basically a formal resolution that's been prepared by our bond attorney and reviewed by Mr. Albright that notifies the public that these bonds indeed did pass, and we send that to the local government commission to let them know that the bonds have passed too. Then uh, also at the December 3rd Board of Commissioners meeting, you remember when we were putting this plan together, we talked a lot about our desire to uh, hopefully better our credit rating. Uh, and uh, Davenport uh, worked with us and recommended several uh, new policies that the board should adopt for the county that will help us as, uh, when we start issuing these bonds. So you'll see those three policies. They're there in italics. Uh, you, they'll come before you uh, December 3rd for your review and approval. I hope you'll consider them and approve them, and hopefully that will help put us in a better position uh, to improve our bond rate. And then on December 7th, we have scheduled uh, a trip to Raleigh to meet with the local government commission staff. The local government commission is the Department of State Treasurer. They are, who, they are who we will be working with to sell these bonds, and they make sure the process is put together correctly. We're staying uh, compliant with state statutes. Uh, our staff, staff from Elements Burlington School System and from the community college will be traveling to Raleigh on December 7th. We're going to meet with the LGC to make sure that all of us understand what their requirements are, how they want to see these projects come before them, what we need to be thinking about and doing to get uh, the bond projects moving. So this last slide about the bond update, I just wanted to let you know of a couple of things that uh, I call them considerations. These are points to ponder, things that we're working on and we'll be working on with the school system staff and community college staff. One is uh, as we get move into these bond projects, there's going to be a need for design funding. Uh, these projects before bond debt can be issued, they must be bid. So they actually have to be bid out, ready to go. And to do that, there's going to have to be design work done. So. Uh, ABSS and the community college will uh, be requiring architectural services soon to do this uh, uh, design work. Uh, and bonds can reimburse those costs, but they don't generally front that. Uh, you're not usually issuing a bond to go pay an uh, architect firm to do this uh, design work. So we'll be looking at, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll work with the school system and community college staff and look at all available current capital outlay funds, any capital reserves, uh, fund balances, where might money be that could be fronted uh, to pay for these uh, design services? Again, once the debt's issued, we'll be reimbursing uh, wherever we get that money from for design. But that's important for you to know and to know that we'll be working with the school system and community college to put that together. Also, we're going to be talking with the Bond Council about, uh, we're asking that for their opinion and advice on using bond funds uh, to hire someone to be a board project liaison for all of these projects to help school system, community college, and Alamance County track uh, the progress and uh, what's going on with each one of the bond projects. We feel like that would be important for the public. We want to ensure that they are fully aware of how these projects are going and they understand as well as each board. Uh, it may be possible to do that with bond funds, uh, so we'll be asking about that. And if that does happen, it will come to you and will also have to be coordinated with the school system and community college uh, too. And I just wanted to Take a moment while I'm here. We're very early in the uh, bond issuing process and tell you that uh, we've got a great team at Alamance County Government between Mr. Albright, Ms. Evans, Andrew Rollins. Uh, we have a good group of folks. We'll be working with Davenport. We have a good bond attorney. Uh, we'll also be working with the local government commission who are experts in this field. And uh, we'll be using uh, best management practices. Uh, I think that uh, I, I want to convey to you that I'm very confident but our staff and the resources that uh, we have put together will be able to make this a good process. And we're very committed to working with Alamance Burlington School System staff and the community college staff. I think the groundwork has been laid. We worked with them very closely all through the preparation process, and it went very well. 
I think as these bond projects will be coming to you, uh, we, can, we can look forward to a good relationship continuing. So at this point, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them, but uh, just to try to bring you up to speed on the bond. So. Yeah, you quoted a uh, rate of what, 7 point, what? Seven point eight eight. Yes. Okay. What would the rate be if we went to term? Uh, you know, the other option stretching. If we stretched it out to where they local government commission doesn't like it, but weren't we talking in the four cent range? Well, that was with the uh, local government. I mean, with the uh, sales tax. Uh, if we, if project timing and costs, interest rates, and all those things stay the same, and we structure, we're looking at six point oh five cents versus seven point eight eight. So structuring alone takes it down to 6.05. So. Anybody else have any questions? No? So when, when would the final decision be made about uh, property tax increase? Would that be in, in the budget in, yes. during the budget cycle? Yes, I think once we, we meet with the LGC and we find out if we can use the structuring model and we meet with uh, school system and community college staff and make sure project timing is going to be very important. Uh, if the project timing is the same and if all things are the same, then I'll be bringing you a budget uh, a manager's recommended that will reflect some level of tax increase to pay for this debt uh, because we, uh, we're looking at starting to issue the debt pretty early. Um, I think it's uh, especially for Alamance Burnham, the school system, many of their projects currently are planned to happen within uh, the next two years. So, so as I remember the the Davenport model to get to the 7.88 cents assume that we would issue the debt at the very first budget time. It assumed which, which, that we would I mean, raise we the would property tax. Raise the property taxes, yes. and then we'd sort of bank that tax revenue to, to help pay it. Pay that that. Yes. In doing that, we were able to have a, a rate as low as 7.88 cents. I mean, that would be the max, but yes. Uh, but in, at the beginning, you mentioned that um, the the vote of the voters authorize the board to um, um, raise your taxes. Do the bond, yeah. <laughs> but it doesn't compel the board to right. uh, issue the bonds and raise the property taxes necessary to pay for the debt service. Is that right? That's correct. You, you now, the board now has the uh, authority to use this model of uh, financing and, and taking on debt. But it, it is not compelled. This, this bond vote is good for seven years. So we have seven years to issue this debt. And again, uh, school system projects and community college projects timeline are laid out in the Davenport plan. So uh, that's, that's what we'll be discussing with them when we meet uh, this month. Thank you. I would say the sooner we borrow that money and get the bonds uh, done, it's going to be cheaper on the, on the taxpayers on the, in the long run. Because mm -hmm. of interest. Because interest rates are going to con continue to go up. We borrow the money now, we're going to buy it cheaper than we borrow later. That's right. That's a good point, Bill. Yep. All right, if there's no further comments, Mr. Haygood is up for the next item on the agenda, the financial report for the first quarter of the fiscal year 2018-19. Thank you. Uh, so this is our first quarterly report for fiscal year 18-19. It's, uh, it's financial and uh, management combined. So uh, I'll, be rep I'll be going over some things with you that are a little high level uh, uh, indications of how, what county government's been up to for the first quarter. So uh, as you remember, I put, we've started putting monthly reports in the county manager report section. So you, you get those every month now. It's kind of a breakdown of county uh, government's finances. So we'll be doing these quarterly reports uh, every couple of months. And you'll also continue to receive annual reports, our audits, uh, our strategic plan and performance management um, uh, reports. So in this uh, quarterly report, I'm going to briefly go over just a couple of our, our funds. I'm going to talk a little bit about general fund, uh, just some general fund functions. I'm not going over the entire general fund. Just, I just picked a few things to talk about. So um, self-insurance funds, our capital, uh, what's going on with us with capital, and our landfill fund. And that gives you an idea of, uh, of how much is budgeted this year in each one of these. So our total budget is $176 million, and you can see how it breaks out there. So let me just talk just a moment about our general fund. Uh, really, there are four categories in general fund spending. 
that make up more than 75% of the entire general fund budget. Uh, our county workforce is one of those. Uh, that's our employees. And then, of course, their fringe benefits. So their salaries and fringe benefits are a very large part of our general fund spending. And this, this is part of the reason why we talk a lot about our employees being our, our number one resource in county government. There's no doubt about it. We make our biggest investment in these employees. Uh, we also uh, spend a significant amount of money out of general fund on education. That's school system, community college, operating and capital outlay, and debt service. We put debt service in here for you to just see uh, because it's currently about 6.5% of the general fund budget, but as we issue these bonds, that will, of course, go up and it will become even more and more important in our general fund. So just a brief overview of county workforce. Uh, for the first quarter of this year, we had over 1,000 folks employed uh, with county government. You can see the breakdown there between full, part-time, and on-call. We had a lot of activity in the first quarter of this year. Uh, as you remember, the commissioners approved a budget, instituted six of seven new positions. Only one of those has not been filled. That is the bookmobile driver. Uh, we are waiting. You know, we're in the process now of hiring for a new uh, library director, and we'll be putting out the bid for the bookmobile soon. So once we get a director on board, we're ready to launch the uh, uh, request for proposals for the bookmobile. We'll hire that person to drive the bookmobile, but we'll wait until we get a little bit further along. Um, you can see some of the activity of, uh, of employees. We currently have, uh, as of the no first of November, we have 29 open positions. Also, just briefly to touch on compensation for our employees, this is the first year we have implemented county merit pay plan. This was uh, based on individual employee performance. Departments also had to achieve 75% uh, of their performance management goals and it was limited to a maximum of 2%. It's been a large adjustment for departments. Uh, everyone now is doing, uh, uh, if they weren't doing them before, they're certainly doing them now, uh, evals on employees. And uh, I have to say a large thank you to department heads and our human resources department. It's been a lot to take on, but it's going well. And I also wanted to give you an idea of what we're spending on training, because again, this to me is an investment in our, our workforce. We've budgeted $363,000 this fiscal year across all of county government for all training, and we've spent uh, almost a third of that, a little over $100,000. So, th and this information is all in your packet too if you can't see these numbers. This, these two graphs give you, and I'm, we're really trying to learn our employees. We're trying to learn about turnover, why are employees leaving, what can we do to retain employees and recruit employees. So this gives you an idea. This is the data that we look at as we go throughout the fiscal year of how our turnover happens. We have involuntary turnover, voluntary. We have retirements. You can see uh, this, this hiring folks, separating folks, retiring folks keeps our departments very busy as well as our human resources department uh, very busy. This is a lot of their work is recruiting people, hiring them, getting them on board. So as I said, we have uh, 29 open positions as of November 1st. The majority of them are in the sheriff's department in detention, uh, also in DSS. Those are our, uh, uh, where the largest number of open positions for employees are. And on the left, you can see department turnover percentages. This is uh, the numbers of folks that turned over you know, between January and October of 2018. And the percentage is, how does that stack up for the total number of employees in the department? So you can see planning. Planning's through the roof. There's only two full-time employees in planning. And this, fiscal, uh, this calendar year, we lost both of those employees. Uh, so uh, they weren't both gone for the entire time, so it's 90%. But uh, that has a significant effect on the department uh, to lose both folks. So. Uh, just briefly to talk about our self-insurance funds. This is very important information. We are tracking this very closely. Our workers' comp, we are self-insured. As you've heard me talk about before, that means county government is in the background paying all the bills, all the claims. Uh, we've had a, in workers' comp, we have rising costs of just health care in general, as well as increased number of claims. We've instituted some methods to try to uh, limit uh, the uh, continued expense in workers' comp, some safety programs. So for this fiscal year, we budgeted $805,000, and we've expended a little over $250,000. And currently, uh, at, this is estimated uh, for the end of June, we have $506,000 in fund balance. Health insurance is a different story. I know everyone has heard me talk lots about county employee health insurance. Uh, the costs continue to go up. We have this year, as you know, instituted new health plan options. We're offering employees three different plans. For fiscal year 1819, we budgeted $10.7 million for our entire health insurance program. Uh, it's a, it's a, quite a significant amount of money for us. We've expended $3.2 million so far. We are still running a fund balance deficit. Uh, the fund balance is uh, a little over $2 million in the hole, but we have a finance plan to restore our fund balance that the board has approved back in 2015. 
We transferred $2 million back in 2015 from workers' comp over to health insurance, but we're still $2 million in the hole. But we did make that move to try to fix it at that time. So we've made some very difficult uh, moves by changing our plans, uh, and we've increased the premiums that the county pays into it. We've also, uh, this is the first year that county employees still have, they have a free insurance, uh, one free insurance plan, another two insurance plans cost either $25 or $50 per month. So employees are having to pick up some of the premiums as well as the county covering the increased cost of uh, premiums. So. Uh, just briefly to talk a little bit about capital outlay, uh, you can see, I, I thought it'd be helpful just to tell the board, at this point for the school system, we budgeted a million dollars in capital outlay and we have paid uh, $333,000 uh, to the school system uh, so far. For the community college, we budgeted $440,000 in capital outlay. We have paid the community college $146,000 plus dollars thus far uh, from fiscal year 18-19. And for county government, we budgeted $250,000 for the county's capital uh, outlay and capital needs, and we've encumbered uh, a little over $143,000. So work is happening, projects are happening. Uh, uh, everyone's getting their, uh, their projects underway for the fiscal year. The last fund I want to talk about for just a moment is the landfill. Uh, the financial status, you can look at the report that's included in the county manager's report and see the actual landfill fund breakdown. Uh, one important thing to note is we have uh, available for post-closure costs $10.8 million. That is cash, that's liquid, uh, and that is in compliance with the state of North Carolina, so we are in good shape with our uh, closure, post-closure costs. And then at the last commissioner meeting, there was a discussion about life of the landfill. And this is something that uh, Richard and his staff at the landfill and I have spent a lot of time thinking about uh, because that's, you know, the, the goal of the landfill is to, uh, we want that place to last for a very long time and be efficient. So just to give you some data, and the, the, the next slide, you can see there's actually a map of all this information. But um, the active cell that they're currently burying waste in has another 3.6 years of life left. Uh, we have some permitted cells that, are, that will be ready to go, but they're not active yet. You can see that phase two has six years, phase three, eight. Phase four has 51 more years. And then we have uh, 49 acres of land that is not permitted. This is a property that the landfill staff under Richard's guidance are working to do the, the preliminary work to get it permitted. Uh, we estimate that it'll be another 38 uh, years of life more or more uh, in that unpermitted site. So we have over 100 years of life left at the county landfill at this point. And this, this map just breaks all that information out for you. You can see the different areas highlighted in different colors, and the legend tells you the, uh, uh, the amount of time left in each one. So I know this isn't necessarily a com completely about finances. Uh, it's, it's a little bit of an overview of how finances tie into county government operations. But um, I hope you found it useful, and we'll be doing this again in a couple of months. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to try to answer. There's no, act, no action required for this item. It's just an update. On our turnover, Brian, what are we doing to track the people that are getting that are turning over and maybe going elsewhere? Are we following up to see? I, I know we've got this wage plan study that we've got to move forward with some to be in competition with local counties, uh, sheriff's department, and all that because our guys are paid less than a lot of the surrounding police departments. Are we tracking these people as they leave and? try to find out where they go to? We do, uh, our, our human resource department does an exit interview with every employee that leaves, whatever, uh, for whatever reason that they leave. And uh, we ask them a number of standardized questions. Uh, you know, why are you leaving? Uh, would you recommend the county government uh, to someone you know or to your family members? And uh, so we're trying to gain from those employees. Tell us why you're leaving. Compensation is, is a factor. Uh, quite often, uh, and, there are, and we share that information with the department heads too, so they can see for their department why are folks saying they leave, is there anything they can glean from those reports that might uh, help them strategize about how to keep folks, because it, as you can see, when that turnover, uh, the county is moving all the time, folks are coming and going all the time, and it, it, it's a, uh, you have to have a serious commitment to staff to try to keep them, because once you get them on board, you get them trained, you really want to retain them as long as you can, so we do, we do poll them when they leave and then share that data with the department head too. So, so when I first came on the board, we uh, finished the wage and classification study and, and we, uh, that first year, I remember <coughs> the first budget that I was involved in, we um, put our staff in, in new places on 
the, the pay ranges for each position and to be more marketplace competitive. And what we did didn't bring everybody up to full marketplace com competitiveness, but it was a start. And then I don't think we ever did anything after that. So we must be way behind. Well, and part of the difficulty, I would say, is when you look at attempting to balance raises for employees that would get them to market and uh, addressing some concerns we have in our health insurance fund, that, that has been very difficult because uh, I think this fiscal year we put an additional 750000 new county dollars in the health insurance fund to help to pay the premiums. And I don't remember, that, that may have equated out to close to a 2% raise itself for employees. But it has to be done. We, we, can't run that, uh, we can't run that fund into the ground uh, anymore. In fact, we're, we're, um, our auditors, uh, the Department of Health and Human Service, ask us about that fund. We get asked about it quite often. What's going on with that? What are you doing? So it's, it's been uh, a difficult balance to strike between trying to make sure wages stay competitive, but that we keep uh, health benefits as good as we can and affordable as we can. So. Uh, I think it's important. I mean, the work of government, I've said many times, doesn't happen here on the dais. It happens mm -hmm. with our staff. They're the ones doing the important work. And, and we really need to invest in them. It's a pay me now or pay me later situation as far as I'm concerned because there's a cost of turnover. You just mentioned training, new people coming in. I mean, we're the training grounds. I hear this from certain department managers all the time that we seem to be the training ground uh, for surrounding counties. And it's costing us. I agree, and, and uh, it, you can see we, we invest in employees. They are the way that county business gets done, and uh, we'll continue to try to strike that, that balance, as I say, between trying to keep us competitive and make sure our, uh, our benefits are also competitive, too. All right. Thank you, Mr. Haygood. Thank you. Next on our agenda is a presentation from Sheriff Johnson. Sheriff, it's all yours. <laughs> Good evening, Commissioners. I'm going to call Sheriff Sam Page from Rockingham County up because we're sharing some of the same concerns with the problems we're encountering, and I would like to introduce Sheriff Sam Page this time, Rockingham County. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sam Page, Sheriff of Rockingham County, North Carolina. I live at 645 South Madison Street in Ede, North Carolina. And uh, I would like, first off, to say congratulations to Sheriff Johnson for his reelection here as your sheriff in Alamance County. I'll give him a hand later. <laughs> uh, the good thing is also I'll be working with him for the next four years, which is great. But um, I talked to him the other day, and he told me that he was going to be speaking to our commissioners here um, on issues dealing with the uh, drug trafficking issues that we, that we see in our communities. And a lot of times what happens in his community or Guilford County other communities, we see it in our communities too, even small communities. But I'll try to be brief and just touch on a few, few notes I've made. But, you know, first of all, I want to say something about your sheriff. He and 3,080 plus sheriffs across America, we took an oath of office to protect the citizens of our communities, to uphold the laws, to uphold the Constitution, and that's what he's doing, and that's what we all do, try, strive to do uh, across America, and I appreciate what he's doing as a neighboring sheriff. I've known him for 35 years. The first time I met him, we were working on a homicide case. I was a narcotics officer, came out, worked in investigations, and a four-year-old four -year case, a person involved in the drug business was a, a witness, was federal witness, was killed. We worked together and cleared the case. Two people went to prison. So we started back in, the, back in 85. Um, Sheriff Johnson and myself have a mutual interest. We wanted to know where are the drugs coming from, how are they getting into our communities, and what can we do at the local level, and then working with our state and national sheriffs. So what do we do? We went out to Texas. We went to El Paso, near Juarez, to find out how the drugs get into our communities and how it gets back here. Um, personally, I've gone to Arizona a few times. I've met, met with, worked with the local law enforcement down there. I was down in McAllen, Texas in 2014 when they had the border surge. What are we seeing right now, four years later? Worse. They need help. But we do know that when our drugs come across our border, 90% of those drugs, according to the DEA, methamphetamines, heroin, cocaine, marijuana, fentanyl are coming from our southern border and coming to our country. The 300 plus international points of entry, and they also come through those places too. But we need to work together in our communities, 
I'm sure in Alamance, as I am in Rockingham County and across the state and across the country, we're having people die because of opioid issues. We're having people die because of fentanyl and because of heroin. 44 people died in my county last year. Numerous people were administered Narcan to save their lives. Somebody said, well, why do we keep doing that? And I said, well, I can tell you this, if you don't come back the next time and administer Narcan if they need it, they won't get a second chance. It's about saving lives. That was what we do in law enforcement and public safety. Locally, the opioid ep epidemic is a problem that we're dealing with. We know where the drugs are coming from, and we've got to cut that flow. Nationally, border security. We've got to secure our borders first. We've got to cut the flow of drugs into our country. We've got to enforce uh, our immigration laws. We've got to enforce our drug laws. And also, we've got to provide treatment for the person with addiction, and we've got to provide education for our kids before they get to that point where they start using. Myself and Sheriff Johnson are members of the Piedmont HIDA, the High Intensity Drug Trafficking uh, Task Force. I've been on it a few years. Sheriff Johnson's been on it longer. Since 2010, 15 persons associated with the Mexican drug cartel, illegally in our country, have been arrested for trafficking drugs in my community. Sheriff Johnson, with his program 287G at the time, I came to him and said, can you help me process this person because I don't have the capability. He helped me. So we, we worked together a lot. Just last week, two weeks ago, two more persons were arrested for trafficking uh, 11 pounds of marijuana packaged. Two persons illegally in our country, one person with a regional address, one person with a Burlington address. There's connectivity. We've got good roads here in North Carolina. We've got good roads across our country. But North Carolina is number two, according to DEA, in drug trafficking routes next to the Atlanta region. People use those roads. In a couple of days, what comes through the border doesn't stay there. It comes through our communities. I've heard some conversation about ICE, but I'm, I'm going to say one thing before I go there is here's what I support. Legal immigration, supporting the rule of law, and also I support the border security effort for my president. ICE and Border Patrol. Our ICE agents do, do one primary purpose. They enforce immigration law. They enforce immigration law in the interior. Our Border Patrol agents enforce border law enforcement. Under the last administration, if our ICE agents and Border Patrol agents who have federal authority cannot act, if, if they cannot act, and if local law enforcement has no federal authority can enforce, the question I ask to the commissioners is, who's doing the job? Nobody. That's why we have to support our ICE agents to protect America. We need to support our Border Patrol agents. In our jails, we as sheriffs, regardless who comes to our jail and comes to our jail, we need to know who's coming in and then who's being released back out into our communities. It's called public safety and protecting the public. We have that obligation. I welcome local, state, and federal support in the work that I do as Sheriff, as Sheriff Johnson does. And I would hope in this new Congress that they fund the Border Security Initiative to help us slow the flow into our country of the illegal drugs, but I also would hope that working together, our Congress will work together on all sides to reform our immigration laws that need to be fixed. But I can tell you this, if we fail to secure our borders, every sheriff in America will become a border sheriff. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Ma'am, before you leave, let me ask you a question. Yes, sir. How many Carl Axel fish fries did you go to? None, sir. None? <laughs> None, sir. <laughs> I used to live up there, and I remember Carl, obviously Vernon, and all y'all. Let me ask you a question. Yes, sir. If you don't mind. Go ahead, sir. There's a UCR report there. I think it's sanctioned by the FBI. Yes, sir. Um, and it shows the number of sheriff's department employees per 1,000 residents in, in counties. Um, and just to give you a rundown of what was on a report that I just saw within the last couple of days, said that uh, there were one, two, three, four, six counties surveyed, kind of 
in a peer group situation like, you know, our size, socioeconomic, so yes, sir. Cabarrus, Alamance County, Catawba, Davidson, Rowan, and Randolph. And the average of those six were 1.8 deputies or sheriff's employees per 1,000. Yes, sir. Of a yes, sir. 1.8 was the average. Uh, Randolph was at 1.6, Rowan 1.5, Davidson 1.0. Catawba 1.7, and Alamance was at 1.9, and Cabarrus 2.8. The average was 1.8. Yes, sir. What, what is Rocket Hill County's uh, ratio there? I don't, I don't have that information with me, and I, I, was, I was planning to come and strictly talk to you on uh, drug issues okay. that are affecting our communities. I appreciate you asking. Uh, I will say that uh, I believe that the sheriff also, Sheriff uh, Johnson has some information on what the federal recommendation is, but I don't have what our okay. individual recommendation Well, with the UCR be the federal recommendation. I mean, that is FBI. Yes, sir. That, that's what they're, that's the standard. Yes, sir. Okay. But I, but I want to say something. Um, I've been in office for 20 years. Um, and of course, you know, between 1981, when I first came to the sheriff's office and then where we're at right now, 35 years later, uh, you know, we've lost a lot of business, a lot of industries and it, and it's hit us hard tax wise and everything like this. But in our County, I haven't had any additional manpower increases since 2006 in the field on the patrol division. We do need help, but I also are sympathetic and understand my commissioner's point. We don't have the monies, but uh, if there are any federal grants out there, any federal grants or, or grants through DPI for our school resource officers, we're going to apply for them and we'll do what we can do. Uh, but we're going to continue protecting and serving the citizens and that's what we're supposed to do. But I will, yes, I'm going to be asking for manpower because I need it, but we're going to do our best. Could you relay that stat to the sheriff though uh, about yours? I will, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'll make I a note. I appreciate your voice in this mm -hmm. issue because uh, it's, it's a lonely wilderness at times of, of inaction uh, by people. And that's why we're in the shape we're in nationally and state and, and local, in my opinion, is inaction. And I appreciate you being strong enough to, to not be in that category. Well, I thank you. I care about my country yeah. and I care about the future of this country. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Sir. Thank you. First of all, commissioners, I want to thank my staff that's here tonight. They've worked extremely hard ever since I've been sheriff, and uh, certainly they deserve better sometimes than what we're giving them, and that's what I'm appearing before you tonight. Uh, I know that you commissioners have a, uh, a big job to do. In 2002, I was elected sheriff of Alamance County. At that time, I promised the citizens of Alamance County that I would protect them against all foreign and domestic enemies in this county. I took the oath of office swearing to uphold all the laws of this great nation, whether I agreed with those laws or not. This nation is a nation of laws. Tonight, I stand before you asking you to help me fulfill my promise and the promise you made to the citizens of Alamance County when you ran for office and was elected. Many are, uh, we are in troubled times in this nation, state and county, and believe me, we are. Many people do not want to follow our laws and could care less about the problems it is causing our nation and the disruption in our society. I say, if you don't like the laws that are on the books, work civilly to change those laws, not tear down people's property or disrespects others' views and beliefs like it's happening in this nation. This is America, home of the free and the brave. Our forefathers fought to give us what we got today. Our fathers of the Constitution didn't want our country to turn the way it's turning today. Years ago, someone said to me, Mexico would take over the United States without firing a shot. I laughed when I first heard this statement. Today, I am sure that this is not going to happen. I am not sure. Our country is currently being, our county is currently being invaded by the Mexican Sinaloa cartel, and I'm not afraid of them, folks. They are preying upon our citizens with violence, murders, drug dealings. 90% of all drugs coming across our borders from Mexico is used by United States citizens. The sad thing is the majority of the other crimes 
being committed in our nation and in this county and state are the result of illegal drug use and drug dealings. If you do not believe me, come to our jail. Talk to the people in that jail. You will find that they're in there for breaking and entering, armed robbery, drug killings, assaults involving the drug traffic in our nation. That is totally unacceptable for me as sheriff. We say drug use is a sickness. Well, I believe it is when it comes to mental illness. That's why we're working so hard on the Stepping Up Initiative. However, drug dealing is not and should not be tolerated by any means in this country, state, or county. <coughs> when the cartels enter our county, state, and nation and are caught, we should show no mercy on them when it comes to the court and the sentencing here. These individuals are crossing our border every day with millions of dollars worth of illegal drugs being sold to our children and our people in this nation. Tonight I will show you just a small percentage of the problems the Almax County Sheriff's Office is facing in a PowerPoint. Why and what is needed to allow us to continue our fight. We must protect our citizens from these vicious predators lurking in our society and preying upon our citizens. It is costing our taxpayers billions of dollars every year for senseless deaths, medical treatment, rehabilitation, holding inmates, criminal investigations, court proceedings, and attorney fees, and many, many other costs associated with this criminal activity. If we attack this problem in the right way, we could use the money saved to feed our hung to every hungry person in this nation. We must open our eyes and close our borders to the cartels. We must do what is right for our country. We must vigorously enforce the laws that are on the books. All laws, including immigration laws. Tonight, I ask you, the commissioners, to please help me do that. Let us jointly take a stand and let all people know that we will not tolerate lawbreakers in Alamance County and that we are not going to be a sanctuary county for the foreign criminal element that is destroying our society and killing our children. With that, I want to do a video presentation. Anybody that's got any weak stomachs, you may want to leave. Because you're going to see what my officers see every day in this county dealing with what's going on here. And I'll be honest with you, as sheriff, I am very upset that the way we're looking at it in this nation. As you see here, this is the old and the new. Back when the old was here, the drug cartels were just starting to sell and buy property up in Alamance County. Okay, drug flow in Alamance County. This was provided to me by the Drug Enforcement Administration, showing where the drugs come across and where they came to. Guess what? That's little old Alamance County. Used to, the drugs would come from these areas to Alamance County. Now they're coming to Alamance County, being distributed all over this nation. People say, well, sure. Why is Alamance County known as the drug hub of the southeastern United States? I can tell you right now, we have two major interstates, 85 and 40. When we tighten down on those areas with our special ops and our Drug Enforcement Administration people, guess what? Alamance County, they drop their drugs here. They can go 62, 49, 54, 87, 61. I could go on and on anywhere in the southeastern United States to distribute their narcotics. I'm showing you some money seizures and uh, some things resulting. Some things do not have headings because there's investigation still going. This was a money seizure in Alamance County. 39 kilograms of cocaine seized in Alamance County. Uh, kilogram of tar heroin uh, in green level seized. And when this, we seized this, we hadn't seen heroin here in a long time. This is black tar heroin. Alamance County drugs here, 12 kilograms of cocaine, $30,000 value death for distribution in Washington, D.C. and Baltimore. You say, Sheriff, how do you know that? We have our ways in investigation. That's all I'm going to say. 1,000 pounds of marijuana seized at about 119 in Alamance County. 
Guess what we found with that 1,000 pound man? One illegal cartel member with a nine millimeter semi-automatic pistol and a TV was always in that trailer. They were using this as a stash house and distribution house. Hundred, or excuse me, 60,000 kilograms of cocaine, 132 pounds worth 1,800,000. This was seized at the Burlington Airport a while back. Uh, as a plane come in, we got a tip. We set up. We followed the cartel people with the suitcases. They got in the car. They traveled, and when they made their first mistake of not giving a signal and turning in front of someone, we stopped them. We got this out of the vehicles, their suitcases. 20 kilograms from Tucson, Arizona, destined for Alamance County. Once again, you say, how do you know that, sir? There's a thing called wires, and that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> Alamance Orange County I seizure, $470,610 wrapped like that. The reason it was wrapped like that because it had been in the presence of cocaine. And if you put a dog in that truck, he'd have a hard time being able to smell the cocaine on the money. I'm at, here's another 750,000. This is our Alamance County Narcotic Enforcement Team and DEA. And we have a couple of our officers here tonight. And there's a whole lot more we could be showing you that, that's been done. But I'm getting tired of people saying, hey, we're pick, picking on these people, the, uh, the uh, cartel people, Mexico. Let me tell you something. My job is sheriff to protect the people of this county. Alamance County currency, 1.5 million storage facility in Hall River. This was in June. Alamance County currency seizure, don't have the amount, and there's a reason for that. Another one, don't have the amount, reason for that. Cartel related. 530,000 seized local center local cartel members of Alamance County. Another seizure, 255,000 seized from drug traffickers. 68,000. Seized during a net investigation of local cartel members in Alamance County. 390,000 seized from local merchants or members of the Sinaloa drug cartel. Alamance County. Sinaloa cartel is one of the most violent cartels in Mexico. It's also been known as the new generation springing out from there. Another 145,000 seized during a net investigation of local Sinaloa cartel members. 470,000 seized Sellers Mill Road in a stash house. Cartel members. $147,985 Lamb Road and Snow Camp. Getting down in my territory now, Tim. <laughs> You're close, huh? That's right. Don't like that. <laughs> Alamance County Currency. According to Drug Enforcement, this is an older slide. According to Drug Enforcement Administration in 2008, the Border Patrol seized $1,850,000 from drug trafficking organizations that originated from Alamance County, North Carolina. You say, Sheriff, how do you know that? Once again, we sometimes follow these people from Alamance County all the way to the Mexican border. And because if we stop them in Alamance County and take that money, they're going to kill the first person they think had anything to do with it, and we've got to unsolved homicide because they're going to scoot back across the border. During 2008, law enforcement outside of Alamance County were getting seized in excess of three million, which was deaths for Mexico from Alamance County. A lot of times, the money will go up the road, get in Arkansas, we'll get Arkansas state troopers to stop them, et cetera, traffic stop. But this right here comes from the Drug Enforcement Administration. 38 kilograms of cocaine and 243,000 John Lewis Road in Berlin. That's northern part of Alamance County. Okay, this is uh, where we arrested some people, and you're going to laugh at this. Less than a half a mile from my house, some cats come in and set up meth, selling meth. <laughs> now, I got inundated by <laughs> citizens that lived in my community, and it wasn't funny. And I called my people, our special operations base. I said, I want them out of there. I want them caught. I want it done legally and get them out of here. And they did the drug bust of this particular individual, and we later was able to catch this guy who was involved in it, Mr. Tyler Spencer Stewart, Mr. Joshua Michael Boggs, Belmont Street in Burlington, and Miss Tabitha Shepherd. But the key was who they were getting there from because they are American citizens. Mr. Ricardo Barrera Hernandez, we've searched. His house, I mean, they uh, excuse me, stopped his car. He's a member of the Sinaloa cartel. 
There our dog hit, and this is what was found. Methamphetamine, look at the weapons. Okay, from there, we were able to uh, continue. This is some of the other seizures from him. This young man right here lived near Southern High School in a mobile home park, was running drugs for the other individual. We raided his trailer one night. He was not there. His girlfriend or wife was arrested, and that's her. And then later on, we get a call to a disturbance down at that trailer, which you can figure out what it was. And that's him after he was arrested. That he'd got into an altercation at the trailer. We were able to serve the outstanding warrant where we'd been looking for him. Here. Now, folks, this is less than a mile from the, uh, from the Burlington Police Department and was a operating business. Quality Motors on Church Street. Our ANET group did a search. That's 114.4 pounds of cocaine seized in metal pipes. Metal pipes was hauled by the cartel into this business that was distributed in a front for narcotics. And uh, the fire department, you notice there, is cutting those pipes in two. Here are the kilos. That's what it looked like. The guns were seized there and the drugs seized there. And guess what, folks? Some of these drugs going to your kids and my kids, going to other people, over into Sam Page's county, what we're finding a lot, going to Orange County. And this is the drug hub distributing those blasted things. Three kilograms of cocaine <coughs> seized in the ANET investigation on Stockard Road. Once again, that's getting out toward my area. 0.5 kilogram of cocaine during a net traffic stop. Marijuana grow operation. <coughs> 550 pounds of marijuana stockard road. 80 kilogram steroids seized during a net investigation. These guns here, that some of these guns were brought by a Ford truck registered to Lee County. How many of y'all remember the officer that was shot on Anthony Street? here in Alamance County four or five years ago, shot in a drug deal. Guess what? That truck, Alamance County was supplying Lee County with their narcotics. They busted a guy in Lee County and he rolled over and agreed to bring them to the distributor here in Alamance County. <coughs> As a result, we had an officer shot and one of the suspects was shot. Okay. Here, been a few years back, DEA Task Force Operation Mad Cow, which we had officers assigned to her, brought them have officers assigned to it. But 63 arrests, 63 convictions, three fugitives, on and on, on the seizures. Operation Rain Man, a similar operation, 29 arrests, 29 guilty pleas, two fugitives. You see all the seizures there. But what bothers me more than anything, folks, is Samuel Berzera. Jose Vargas, Sin Law Cartel. You say, well, sure, did you identify these people? No. This is drug enforcement administration that has undercover people in Mexico and in the U.S. These were dealing with Cliff Mann, who's been a dope dealer in Alamance County for years until he got caught. Michael Hawkins, dealing with the Sin Law Cartel. You've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine Sin Law Cartel members that were taken down in that operation. And that is only a small percentage, folks, of what is operating in this county. You see, look at the arms. Look at the ones that were armed that were taken down. When I come in office, yeah, I want you to you see, this is what we're having to deal with all the time. Before I come in office, it's July 6, 2002, out in Tangle Ridge, Trail, Mobile Home. He didn't do right with the cartel, so they come to his trailer, they kill him, they take his partner, puts his face on a stove, fries his face, and then shoots him. Because somebody didn't pay the bill. Another one, Raul Nato, March 4, 2007, I was sheriff then. He was dumped on Highway 54 near the Hall River Bridge. He was beaten to death in Motel 6 in, in uh, Burlington, brought out and dumped. All narcotics involved. Right now, we, Know the female, 
She scooted back to Mexico. A lot of times they start tales will bring somebody to Mexico to do the killing and haul buddy back in Mexico because you can't find them when they get back there. The government's not going to cooperate with them because many of the government officials are crooks. Young lady here, her husband was dealing with the, uh, some of the cartel members in Siler City. Well, something didn't go right. They killed her. Another killing, nothing on it other than uh, North Carolina 19, uh, 119 July. There's a raising behind that. That's another dead homicide we had to work. Here's another homicide drug related we had to work in this county. This guy right here. He's a cartel member out in Green Level, uh, North Carolina, uh, Trailer Park. Some of the Alamance County citizens tried to do a drug deal with them. They did the deal. The guy said didn't pay. So what did they do? This guy did. Him and his group went and kidnapped the grandfather of one of them that didn't pay. And told him we're going to kill him. He brings our gun back or you pay us the money you owe us. Well, the people that had, hadn't paid the bill, I'm going to call, we'll call an answer their way to try. Comes back with the intention of not paying the bill. And he winds up getting killed, and they've got the grandfather back after shooting him out there. And this is what we found after investigating. That's cocaine, that's money. They took and hid this in the woods. Okay. There was a people involved in that killing that were charged as one that we didn't get. And we looked for him for three years. Now what is this? It just happens to be the trailer in Lumberton, North Carolina, where the individual was kidnapped across from Hershey's in Medan and held in carried to Lumberton. They were going to kill him if his brother, who was in Mexico, didn't ride a load of money, dope to back here and load the money back to pay the debt. When we, uh, Homeland Security, Sheriff's Office, FBI, everybody was working. Thank goodness they kept his phone when they kidnapped him. And we were able to go up on his phone and get the location of where he was. This place was surrounded in Lumberton, but they didn't know it. When the old drug boy stuck his head out, he wished he had. <laughs> and we recovered the boy. He had been stomped. Alejandre, uh, hold on, I'll give you his. Gonzalez was the one that was kidnapped. He had nothing to do with any of that. And they were going to kill him unless. This guy here, he was involved in the shootout where the guy laying on the slab was murdered. He, we had warrants for him for a couple years, three years, when we got him into kidnapping. He was involved with the cartel, and she was to kidnap him, the guy taking him down alone. And they were going to kill him if they didn't produce that. This picture here, Sam talked about going on the border. It's a 20, uh, 12 border tour that we took. Tell you what, you hear about the great big wall on the border. You see that one strand of barbed wire fence, it goes about 200 miles. A doggone flea can crawl across the border and through the Rio Grande. When I went out there, I thought the Rio Grande was a big river. It was about as wide from here to the wall there and dry as a doggone dog. Doggone dog. <laughs> Beat all over sinking. Okay, here's some more pictures of uh, firearms and stuff seized by our ANET and our uh, narcotics group here in the camp. This guy here, remember we're talking about the Anthony Street shooting of the officer? The Lee County officer? Well, this is the rabbit head that did that. He is a blood gang member, shot Lee, Lee County Deputy Charles William Drew. An officer was just trying to do his job. And this was in January 10th, 2008. <coughs> Okay, you say, well, Sheriff, now why are you going to the Democrats of Alamance County? This is where the commissioners come in. Folks, I am killing my people working overtime, trying to stop some of this going on here in Alamance County. Now, I give you the population, of, and this is the most recent I could find, which is 2017, of the entire county. I also found the recent population of the cities in Alamance County. 
Now, this is only the legal residents of Alamance County that uh, take it. With that, miles covered by Alamance County Sheriff's Office, 435 square miles. Let me ask you something. When you're out here with having no bug out here, you having a fight, and the closest car is on the far side of the county staying over 45 minutes on a blue light and siren, and 100 miles an hour to try to get you to help you, look at the, the situation we put the officer in and the public in. The, our population, 72,567 that we cover out in the county. But what the people don't understand, a lot of people don't, we also have to serve every civil paper in the city and keep the jail, run the court, protect the judges, do uh, uh, our courthouse security. Total Alamance County Sheriff's Office employees a total of 276, but only 140 are sworn deputies. Now, we were talking a minute ago about the uh, number of officers per thousand population. Federal government said really 2.4 per thousand population. 2.4, very minimum 2.2 for a safe state. Well, what the, the 2.4 is actual officers that is on the street enforcing the law, not the courthouse security, not the people serving civil papers. And I'll show you where we stand with that. Okay, if, if one using national minimum of officers per thousand population, which is 2.2, that's a national minimum they <coughs> talk about. Per thousand, we would need 158 sworn uh, working law enforcement officers, and we now only have 140. And so that means if we use that, we're still 18 short. But even then, if we take our civil officers, courtroom officers, and courthouse security out, we really only have 115 officers working the street. Thus, we're 43 officers short using the 2.2 officers per thousand population or 59 using 2.4 officers per thousand population. And we have, because of this, we have had to take people out of the detention center, get them BLET trained to help outside. Thus, now we have shortened the number of people in the detention center. We've got to have more detention officers, and we need more officers outside. And as you see, okay, this is what I want to show you. From July 1st, 2016 to June 30th, 2017, cost for service was 66860 coming in to Central Communication. This does not count the people that walk off the street that's had a crime committed against them and uh, comes into the sheriff's office. This does not count that. The average response time then was 14 minutes and 42 seconds. I'm telling you, folks, that's hauling it to, to cut it down. Average length of call, 49 minutes 32, I mean 49 minutes 32 seconds. From July 1st, 2017 to June 3rd, 2018, calls for service had increased to 78,043, not counting what comes in to the sheriff's office. Now you say, wow, the response time's down. <laughs> you know why that response time is down? Only look at that major over there. He has to answer calls if he's out there and something comes in. Our dog catchers have to, or dog warden have to answer calls. And they shouldn't have to do that because that's taking them away from the duties they did. But we have got to respond. Our job is to protect the citizens of Alamance County. You notice uh, uh, average length call, 53 minutes, 21 seconds. Let me tell you something. We're really not doing uh, just service to our citizens when we go on serious calls and no longer that than that. We miss an evidence. We have got to have help. We have got to cut this response time down, and we have got to be able to serve our citizens much better than what we're doing. Okay, from July 1st, 2018 to October 1st, three months now, we've already received 21,441 calls for service. If this rate continues, it will be 85,764 by the end of the year. It's project projection rate. And right now, these three months is usually our slowest months. You get December, when you're having all the family violence and stuff and, and, and things like that, the armed robberies and things. Notice, uh, once again, our, our time, our response time's down. It's because when that call goes out, I'm telling you, our office, if it's a serious call, our office empties, including fat, bald-headed shirt. <laughs> call volume 
do not necessarily account for all self-initiated investigations such as drug investigations, which may total several hundred cases per year. Vehicle stops. If we stop a vehicle for speeding or something and you smell marijuana, search that, that didn't even count. That's not counted in the cost for service. These numbers not necessarily take account the many, many hours of investigation that goes into a case. Some investigations take months and even years to solve. When you work in these cartel murders, it takes a long time. Last fiscal year, there was one officer involved shooting. I regret to say that. 45 people charged with resisting arrest, Alamance County deputy. 22 officers were assaulted, and we were involved in 31 high-speed vehicle pursuits after criminals that either robbed somebody, hauling drugs, etc. Currently, and this is just giving you a rundown of other things we're doing. Currently, we have 357 registered sex offenders residing in Alamance County, and we have to check on each one. Last year, we did 1,226 compliance check, registered 27 new offenders, and made 21 arrests for a violation. If we, we have to keep up with these sex offenders, because they'll go to the schools, they'll go into the churches, they'll go anywhere to try to enhance their ability to attack another child. This bothers me. And uh, uh, Mr. Bird, I want to commend you for the help and try to get this stepping up initiative here. Heroin overdoses July 1st, 2016 to June 30th, 2017. 13 heroin overdoses. Heroin overdose deaths, five. Overdose to other drugs, 27. Overdose deaths to other drugs, none. I want you to look at this. Just from July 1st, 2017 to September 23rd, 2018, we've already had 23 heroin overdoses. Okay. Where is that drug coming from? Straight across the Mexican border into this country. Heroin overdose deaths already two. Overdose of other drugs, 18. Overdose deaths of other drugs, eight. These are our citizens that we're talking about here, folks. The people that we're supposed to protect. This is just some other statistics for you. Cases investigated by Criminal Investigation Division, 752. They investigate the homicides most serious cases. Case investigated by Special Victims Unit. Domestic violence cases, 1,176. Domestic violence protective orders we have to serve, 499. And I want to just make this point. If you think these cats are going to stand around and wait for you to knock on their door to serve a paper, come and go with us and let, you show you, let us show you. Domestic violence arrest, 302. Missing persons, 63. Runaway juveniles, 41. Runaway juveniles located, 41. We take this very serious. We take everything very serious. But when you're talking about kids, different. Case child, child sex abuse cases, 172 children were violated in Alamance County. Elder abuse cases, I'm very uh, passionate about elders being abused. Human traffic cases, four. Evidence unit, our evidence unit processed 5,096 pieces of evidence were logged in. Civil sons, they don't like to stick around for you to serve these either, Mr. Burke. <laughs> 1,373. <coughs> Mattress stomachs, 3,614. Other legal notices, 1,108. Tax execution street. We need to work on that a little bit. I know more people like that. We need the money. <laughs> Child support papers, 1,069. Total animal call, 768. Stray animals trapped, 119. Animals taken to shelter, 934. Calls for service on school campuses. I'm very passionate about this, and I have some of the best school resource officers in this state. 1,529. Investigative report. 267. Follow-up investigations, 118. Charges filed, 204 misdemeanors, 6 felons on our school campus. New concealed handgun permit. Everybody's wanting to get a handgun permit. 1,312. We have to do investigations on these individuals, too, before we issue them. Because if I issue one to a convicted felon, I'm probably going to go to jail with the federal government. Renewed to sell hand government, 1,019. Pistol purchase permit, 1,475. We also do the Alamance Citizens Academy twice a year. Kurt Puckett does an outstanding job of that. We're working very hard on trying to get this stepping up initiative 
in place here in Alamance County, and we do a youth explorer program. Ladies and gentlemen, the reason I'm pointing this out to you, we don't have enough people. And I'm going to be, be straight up front with you and honest. Before I let my name go down with our citizens' blood on, the, on, on my hands, I'm not threatening nobody. I'll go home if I can't do my job the way it's supposed to be done. And right now, I do not feel like we are doing everything we can simply because, one, we can't keep officers that are trained because of the pay, and two, because we're pushing them so hard. And I know you folks, in a lot of ways, got your hands tied. But I'm telling you, I am asking you tonight to help me help our citizens stay safe and help my people to be able to make a decent career and use their experience here without me having to hire a new deputy every day. And y'all know what that takes. Please understand what I'm trying to say. <coughs> Any questions? Tell me this. You got the interstate cut the county in half. What do we got on the northern end? It used to be like three districts on one end, two on we the other side. Actually, yeah, they, we have six districts. Six. They're about pretty well split. Yes, sir. Pretty well split. See, the sad thing is with the call volume right now, constantly going up, and most, if you have a bad domestic violence case and armed robbery, more than one deputy has to respond because not you're going to get somebody killed. The one shooting our officer was involved in, I think the good Lord, he had just, the one of the first officers had just gotten off of probation that day. And if the other two officers hadn't responded with him, I may be in the Greensboro Police Department situation like we were this weekend. Folks, I don't want that to happen. I don't want my officers to get hurt. I don't want my detention officers to get hurt. We have got to do something. Please, I'm begging you. Now, somebody said something about renting uh, detention space to uh, uh, ICE. Let me tell you something. I intend to do that. ICE, you do not, it, you have to have committed another crime other than coming across the border to be deported or to be reported by the detention center. I intend to help ICE house the individuals they've already put in the deportation process. Did we still use secure? Did we ever use secure community? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, we did. Yes, sir. And you'll keep doing uh, I, won't, I won't call it secure communities. Uh, uh, there will be a situation, if we bring someone in we know is lied to us about who they are, whatever, we got a number we can call Raleigh. They will do the interview. We don't touch the interview. And from there they make the decision on what to do. That's similar to, to in a way, to the 2ACMG, we just don't have the database and we don't bring the people in, you know, in for that purpose. Well, I got to put it in a generic term that I can understand it. your reply. I hope I can understand it. You know, I showed you a picture of a girl. This is so, I don't know how to put it. This, I'm hung up on this. I Big time. I have been for 20 years. I showed you a picture of a girl and her mother. Beautiful girl. And they were out driving nearby. And a guy ran a red light. You know the story, but I, I want to repeat it here. No, ran a please red light. do, because there's hundreds of them well, stories out there. You know, I just got to have some reassurance that, that we're going to have a remedy for, for these cases, in my opinion. The guy ran a red light, and he about killed the mother. The mother's got permanent injuries. I stood right in front of her and could see the scars all over her face. The daughter escaped. Mm -hmm. Injury. Came out in conversation at a meeting I was at that the person had no insurance, no license, and wasn't was supposed to be in the country. The judge put him in jail for two months locally. He got out. ICE would not pick him up. Uh, the husband called. The wife called. And. 
I made a reference publicly. I said, I bet he's still driving in that area. And they said, yes. A lot of them. Yes. Sir. Have, it happens that way. Now, what That's I right. want to know is if, if, if a person in that same category okay. runs a red light in this county and, and hits a citizen of our county, and, and, and conditions are the same, the results are the same, what reassurances have we got with any new relationship with ICE that we would uh, be able to uh, see to it it didn't happen again. Well, Mr. Sutton, even under the old program, we did not make a decision of where someone would be deported or not. All we did was process them, found out who they really were, and as, as uh, Sheriff Page would tell you, we want to know who's in our jail. And we found out a lot of them wasn't who they said they were. But we don't do anything as far as the deportation. That is up to ICE. Certainly, I would hope they would never go back in the community. But, as sure, I can't guarantee you that unless the court sent them to prison in state prison. But even then, when they get out, they could be subject to deportation. But I can't tell you they're going to be deported. That, that is not uh, in my power. But do we say to ICE, you can bet I sure try to get them to if they <laughs> violated the law. Yes, sir. In how, that how respect. How long is the average time if you bring an inmate in and they decide they're going to deport them? How long are they in your jail? Well, let me say this. Uh, I was told that if we call them for an interview within 48 hours after that, if they didn't have the detainers here to hold those individuals, for us to turn them loose. And you can bet I'm going to because I'm not going to get sued. And what do they pay per night for Well, it, it, believe it or not, under the, uh, the IGA contract we originally had with ICE, I was told it was taken away when they sued me right. and, and took the 2HMG program. And I could never understand why was I still able to hold U.S. Marshal prisoners when they had taken it. They, they said they didn't take it, so it's still good. At that time, we were paying $61 and some, or getting paid $61 and something. Now I think it's sixty-six thirty-eight. The marshals' uh, service pays, and I'm gonna be honest with you, Mr. Basel. I'm not doing it to make a dime. I'm doing it because the right thing to do, and it helped protect my citizens of this county. Well, you need to know who's in your jail. I, Absolutely. I totally hey, agree we with were that. Uh, until then we were putting gang members in with other rival gang members who are getting jaws broke, counties having to pay medical bills. And it, it was a way of identifying some of these people. Please, if y'all have any questions, please ask. Where, well, do we, where do we go to help you to get the people you need? I mean, do what now? I mean, we're going to have a budget coming up in the spring. I understand. And I recommend that we give the sheriff 18 new employees. <laughs> All in favor, aye. <laughs> That's where we go. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, well, that's where it's done. Well played, Sheriff. But, but I will promise you this. Come and ride with any one of my officers or come and walk the floors in our detention center and get spit on, have feces thrown on you, and you will understand why people don't want to work in the jail or don't want to go outside. We are dealing with some of the worst of the worst of society. Please. Help me support my people well, and 18, these citizens. What ratio would that bring you to? You say you. Let me tell you. The average is what. If I if, let me tell you something. If I could get 18 people, I'd cut somersaults in this room. <laughs> well, what ratio would that put you at? Two two or? Uh, that would uh, hundred actually, uh, 115 actual officers outside that is doing what they should be in that 2.4. You add 18 to that. We're still low, but I can promise you this: we can turn the heat up on some criminal with them 18. And that's what I want to do because we are failing right now and, and, and dealing with the cartel. We're fighting. Uh, it's unbelievable what's going on. I'm catching heck, Barnes County Sheriff. Sam takes a chance now and then poke me. Hey, boy, we just got one of your boys over here with 50 pounds of pot and, <laughs> and stuff like that. And it's really embarrassing. You showed but, a, lot of, a lot of money on the screen there. Do we? You showed a whole lot of money up there on that yeah, screen. Yeah, and guess, guess where it goes. I, <laughs> when we're working with ANET, for instance. 
There's Elon, Hall River, Gibsonville, Mebbin, Graham, Alamance County Sheriff's Department. That money is split among those agencies working the cases. Well, you take a million dollars and split it, you don't have a whole lot. There was a day we couldn't get that money because of the Department of Justice. Uh, you don't have to tell me. You remember that. <laughs> I remember it very well. <laughs> I remember it very well. But I want you to understand, you know, there, there's also out here people are saying the sheriff is a racist. I'm not a racist. By George, I want my citizens protected. Some of my best friends run restaurants here. I know it's here illegal. I could care less. They say they're afraid to come in and report crimes. We have them coming in every day to the sheriff's office. And we have never, ever, ever asked, are you here legally or illegally? We work their cases. And we will continue to do that. However, if they violate the law in this county and we catch them, they're going to jail. I promise you that. Thank you all for, for listening and Probably you won't run me out of the county. We'll, we'll put that on a consideration. List. I'm asking you, please, yes. please, help us. Sheriff, that was a very informative and persuasive presentation. Yeah. Um, I just want to take a minute to note that we had a lot of people who spoke in opposition to working with the Immigration and Customs Enforcement. And um, Sheriff Sam Page started speaking at 829, and exactly five minutes later, most of those people left the building. Um, I think that shows a little bit about uh, people's willingness to listen to other people's point of view and to um, understand where the law enforcement side is coming from in this kind of situation. So, thank you, Sheriff. Thank you. Uh, at this point, ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna have a brief recess before we take on our budget amendments. All right, ladies and gentlemen, if we could return to order, please. We have a few more items on our agenda. Um, the next thing is a budget amendment from the health department. Good evening. I'm going to try to be brief because I know it's very late. Um, and I will also say that both Sheriff Johnson and uh, Sheriff Page covered a lot of the opioid um, statistics that I have as well. But if you have any questions, I'll be glad to go more in depth, but I'm going to keep it sort of brief for you. So the Alamance County Health Department has been awarded um, $67,669 from the Division of Public Health Injury and Prevention Branch um, for a grant titled The Local Mitigation to the Opioid Crisis for Local Health Departments and Districts. And we applied for this funding on behalf of our local um, coordinated community response to opioids, which is now um, soon to be formally called AC HOPE. And this funding will help support harm reduction education and training, overdose response peer support in our community, and the establishment of um, an opioid overdose case review team. All of these um, strategies that are included in the grant are also included in the strategic plan. Um, and just a reminder that that strategic plan came from the 2017 December 2017 Leaders Forum, and also the workshop in May of 2018. I'll be glad to an answer any questions if you have them. Well, I have a question about opioid use. And so there's a, a school of thought that um, one way to prevent or to stop the flow of drugs is to work on the demand side of, of the problem. Are, are we doing anything from a public health perspective on reducing the demand for the drugs to begin with? So I think that the public health response would be prevention and education piece of it, um, which I think both the sheriffs also alluded to. Um, so part of the strategic plan has that as one of the four work groups. Uh, that's right. That, so that, the four that work groups. Opioid summit. That's correct. So the four work groups, uh, which are the aligned strategies, are. Um, treatment and recovery, prevention and education, harm reduction, and also policy. That policy work group is actually going to be sort of the thread that goes through all the other three, um, as each one of those other work groups has some policy built into them. So I think um, this is still sort of getting off the ground. So this is our first, this is one of those things where folks say um, opioids are a public health crisis, um, yet there's not a whole lot of funding that goes with that, and we were lucky enough to be one of the counties to get some funding to go with it, so our first our first push into this will be um, this grant with these three strategies. Thank you. 
right. So we need a yeah, we need a um, motion. I'll make the motion. And I'll second it. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve the budget amendment for the health department. Is there any more discussion? If not, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Thank you. Great. I might just suggest if you're really interested, uh, maybe um, the AC Hope group could come at a later date and give you um, an update as to where we're going, uh, what we've done so far and where we're going. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we have another budget amendment for the Home Care Community Block Grant. Good evening, Commissioners. Um, before you tonight is a revision for the Home Care Community Block Grant. It would be an overall budget increase for our budget of $7,938. The revision that we received from um, part was, I'm sorry, PTRC is for $69,648. The difference there is when we were doing the budget, we were told to use our fiscal year 1718 um, budgets, which we did. So then this will true up just an increase of $7,938. I will inform the board that we would have to appropriate $1,418 of appropriated fund balance. The portion that was going to ACTA, there is a county match for that. So that would be the county's cost. Any questions? I'll make the motion we accept it. I'll second it. Okay, we have a motion and a second to adopt the budget amendment. Is there any more discussion? If not, if not, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Great. Thank you. And then the last item for our budget amendments is a HMEP grant from 2018. Good evening, Commissioner. Uh, I'm here to request an amendment of $10,000 to do a full-scale hazardous materials exercise. This is a uh, Homeland uh, Hazardous Materials Emergency Planning Grant, which the monies will be used to conduct full-scale hazardous material exercise uh, to test the capabilities of the responders and you know four facilities in the county. This will be done in conjunction with the LEPC, the Tier 2 uh, facility itself, along with the fire EMS and the hospital would all be part of this. All these monies would be reimbursed at 100% through the state through the grant program that they've got set up. Sound like a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. I'll make a motion to great that. Idea. I, I just, just for information, so what is the money actually spent on? It'll actually uh, help to provide in the planning process. We will actually use a contractor that will come in and help do the evaluations to make sure we're following uh, the proper processes and all, and we're getting we're meeting our objectives and what we need to do to make any changes, that type of stuff. They'll do our evaluations and all that. So that's what a lot of the money will be used for. Thank you. I'll make a motion and then we pass second. Yeah. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve the budget amendment. Is there any more discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Thank you. Thank you. All right, Mr. Haygood, do you have a report? Uh, the report, the only uh, comment I would make is with uh, the finance report that you have. Uh, this time we did include uh, information with the school system that describes each of the codes uh, in the finance report, and we also <coughs> developed one for the county information too. So from now on, when you get that financial report, it's going to have the school system uh, explanation of what each one of those codes uh, are and what the county. So. Those are very helpful. Yeah. Thank yes, you. thank you. That's all. Sir. That's all. Great, thank you. Do we have any commissioner's comments tonight? Uh, I would just say <coughs> since, uh, this is our first meeting since the election. I'd offer my congratulations to uh, Steve Carter and to Amy Gailey for winning the election. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? I'll pull the vote, thank you. <laughs> um, if there's no more Commissioner, comments, then we'll be adjourned.